This episode of the Creep Street Podcast is brought to you by Martini Coffee Roasters. You know, people always look at me weird when I say I start off every morning with a big old martini. But then I set them straight and I tell them I'm talking about Martini Coffee Roasters Coffee. A delicious coffee made by the Martini family. They roast their coffee using a traditional method of sight and sound to roast those little babies to perfection. And they also sell green coffee beans for those home roasters out there. And right now, fans of the Creep Street podcast can get 20% off their entire order by using the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Once again, for 20% off your order, use the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Martini Coffee Roasters, the perfect coffee to keep you creeps caffeinated. You've taken a wrong turn. Down Creep Street. Citizens of the Milky Way, this is Maureen Bogey. And this is Dylan Hackworth. And you are listening to the Creep Street Podcast. It's time to celebrate, you Creep Street fiends. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Thank you all so much for joining us today, citizens. It really means the world to us. We're so happy to have you with us, and we're going to have one hell of a blast today. Oh, yes. To be kept up on what we're up to, feel free to follow us on Instagram at Creep Street Podcast, Twitter at Creep Street Pod. We're on Facebook, and on our Facebook, we have a subgroup called Citizens of the Milky Way. We recommend you check that out. Also, please like, rate, subscribe, share us on social media, tell a friend, tell a family member, tell your neighbor, tell your doctor, tell your lawyer. Please, please just make sure it's all good before you go, before you Before go you go in. blab in your mouth. And if once a week is not enough for you, and we know that it's not because we just know. Because you're a human being. Yeah. Feel free to check out patreon.com slash creepstreetpodcast for all sorts of bonus content on there. We have three levels, $2 a month, $5 a month, and $10 a month for all sorts of great bonus content, anywhere ranging from movie reviews all the way up to full bonus content episodes chump change we're talking chump change uh so feel free to check that out at patreon.com slash creep street podcast please do now the last couple weeks we have really went balls deep on the whole lizzie borden saga we balled her out we balled out miss borden yeah we sure did it was a blast thank you all yeah thank you all so much for your your kind words about these past couple episodes we really appreciate it and we're so glad that you enjoyed those episodes yes but today we have something a little different a uh definitely bump in the night type story definitely freaky. freaky weird shit. This is one of the most fun I've had researching a subject in, in, in quite a while. I mean, I enjoy everything, but this was one, it just took me so much by surprise. When I started researching it, I already thought I knew what it was, but it just kept evolving, and it's so strange. Yeah, it's really interesting. So let's just jump right to it. Dylan, what the hell are we talking about today? This week's episode is Horror of the Hexam Heads. Alright, let me gently paddle your ass with my sources. Come on. First was a four-part series, uh, a written series of, of articles called The Hexam Heads, parts one through four, over at the Urban Prehistorian, The Hexam Werewolf by Tony Walker at Medium.com. And one of the most impressive sources I've ever encountered, the Hexam Heads blog. Just so much stuff, and I'll talk more about that source later because it just was a treasure trove of information but Ooh. this one is it's hard to define i'm gonna i'm gonna absolutely tell you that this okay. one's hard to define I, it's it's just hard to categorize and at its core this is i guess perhaps a story about cursed objects but it also deals with hauntings cryptids possibly even ancient pagan magic and this story takes place in the north of england in a town called Hexham, which is located in the county of Northumberland, one of the two English counties that border with Scotland, the other being Cumberland. 
It's a modest little town that lies alongside the River Tyne and has a population of roughly, roughly 13,000 people. Like most of our stories, this starts off with a family that most would call ordinary. Mm -hmm. This family was the Robson family who lived at Three Reed Avenue right there in Hexham in a semi-detached house, otherwise known as a duplex. This was also a council house. Council houses were like government housing, Mm -hmm. or our government housing. The neighboring family who lived in one Reed Avenue was the Dodd family. Well, it was a nice spring day in May of 1971. And the two Robson boys were out playing in their backyard. Colin was aged 11, and Leslie, I want to say, was about two or three years younger than him. So not a big difference in age. Uh, Now, some of my sources wrongly state that this happened in May of 1972, but we can confirm it was May of 1971 because at the time, the boy's older sister was away on her honeymoon after having just gotten married. Oh, okay. So the boys are horsing around in the backyard, uh, throwing little stones and pebbles at each other. They were supposed to, I don't know if they were doing some, supposed to be doing work in their garden, but I guess they were, they had like little shovels and they were digging up like little rocks and pebbles and chucking them at each other. Oh God. So they're digging into the ground when Colin hits something solid with his little shovel. Pulling it out of the ground, the boys were surprised to find what appeared to be a lump of sandstone carved into the shape of a head. Now, the carving was rather rudimentary, but it seemed as though it had male-like features. Mm -hmm. And just moments later, Leslie, the younger brother, pulled another head out of the ground. And this one was said to be greenish or gray in color and had elements of quartz in it as well, just like the first one. But this one, it also had a face. It had wide, bulging eyes, a pointed nose, engravings that sort of seemed to emulate like hair that was pulled back. Uh, The features on this head were distinctly just, they seemed more feminine. Okay. Even though if you see these things, they're very rudimentary. Mm -hmm. They're not like elegantly carved. Mm -hmm. They even nicknamed the heads boy and girl just because of their appearance. But yeah, I wouldn't give them top marks for creativity in the naming there. But you know what? We'll give it to them. Certainly. Absolutely. And just for clarity, the sources say the stone heads, these heads were roughly the size of a tennis ball, maybe a little bit smaller. And beneath the heads were what appeared to be like a flattened area. And some theorize maybe they perhaps were attached to a body or were sort of made that way so they could stand upright. So the boys are excited to share with their family what they had found, and uh, the rest of the family were very interested in them but didn't really know what to make of them. But almost immediately after finding these heads, strange things began to happen around the Robson home. Yikes. Yeah. For example, when they would wake up in the morning, they would notice that the heads had turned Hmm. to be looking at them. Oh, God. At first, this was easy to dismiss. Folks would be like, oh, I'm sure I must have placed them like that and just forgot about it. But that wasn't the case. Sometimes they would walk into a room and look back at the heads to find that they had turned to look at them when they were looking in another direction just moments ago. Oh, so it's not just happening like overnight and things like that. It started that way. Right. And then it got to where like one moment they were looking and then when you'd look back, they were looking at it. Oh, God. Yeah. And then that's when strange poltergeist like activity began to happen. Objects like glass bottles or picture frames would suddenly fly off shelves and crash to the floor. And the kids would even report getting pushed or getting their hair pulled. One night after the boys had gone to bed, their parents were downstairs just going about their evening, and they could hear some noises coming from the upstairs that sounded like the boys were horsing around when they should have been in bed. Oh, no. But what they didn't know is that it wasn't the boys. Upstairs in their dark room, the boys were awakened by a strange thumping noise like something had fallen off the shelf. The room was dark, and they couldn't really see anything. And that's when they heard another thump. The boys asked each other, what was that? And they finally worked up the courage to turn a light on, and they found that both of the stone heads were sitting in the middle of the bedroom floor. (gasps) One of the strangest things to happen was when the Robson family one day found their daughter's bed had been completely showered in glass. Oh, God. But none of the windows or anything in the room were broken, nor did it seem like any glass items had been smashed at the time. So where did this glass come from? But it didn't stop there. The Robson family soon began to see strange lights bouncing around in their garden at night. And perhaps weirdest of all, in their garden, right where the stone heads were found, a strange flower began to grow up from the ground, one that none of them had planted. Mm. Now, obviously, it's very common for seeds and pollen and whatnot to blow in the wind and right. and then plant themselves in other places. That's, that's obvious. It's but kind of the whole point. 
But the chances that a flower would grow right in this exact spot is pretty baffling. And there's more about this that I'm going to circle back to at the end of the episode that I couldn't tell was canon or not, and but I want to add it because it's pretty freaky stuff. Okay. Now, also, another thing to note is that some of the sources say the heads were discovered in earlier of 1971, back when it was still winter, and some of them say that when this flower grew, it grew during the winter which made it even oh. stranger. But the best sources I have seem to maintain that it was May. It was already not. Right. So so just keep, take that with a grain of salt. Either way, it's it's strange. Now let's remember that the house that the Robsons lived in was a semi-detached house. Their immediate neighbors living next door at One Reed Avenue, like I said, was the Dodd family, which consisted of Isaac Dodd, his wife Ellen, or Nellie Dodd, and their four children, Brian, Carol, Marie, and Trevor. Now, I don't know if they were specifically aware the Robson boys had found these heads. Uh, I think some of my sources said that they did show them to the neighborhood and stuff like that. But regardless, they also begun experiencing strange things in their house. In fact, what happened to the Dodds goes far beyond just the strange into absolutely terrifying. Mm. One night, Ellen Dodd was putting her daughter Marie to bed, and Marie, I guess, had been dealing with a pretty bad ear infection. So she hadn't been sleeping well. So her mother, Ellen, was just kind of sitting on her bed, just comforting her. She tucks her daughter into bed, and all of a sudden, Marie lets out a blood-curdling scream, screaming at the top of her lungs. Ellen is like, what what is it? And Marie couldn't even speak. She was so terrified. Her hand trembling, Marie pointed behind her mother to the bedroom door. And that's when Ellen, before she even looked for herself could sense that they were not alone. Slowly, she turned her head, and standing there in the doorway was something that could only be described as a monster. It stood about six feet tall. Its lower half appeared to be somewhat human, but its upper half and head seemed to be a mix of a wolf or even a goat. Some descriptions even describe it as having horns like a goat's horn but many others have it just looking more like a werewolf. And it was reaching out to Ellen. Immediately, Ellen began screaming as loudly as her daughter. The creature actually briefly touched Ellen, Mm. but then in a flash got down on all fours and ran out of the room and down the stairs. Ellen obviously is terrified and she's just holding her daughter, but after some time passed and she was able to work up the nerve, she slowly made her way downstairs to find the front door wide open. Oh, no. Oh, my God. As if the creature, like, ran out the door. Because you really, I'm sure she's hoping that this was just all in her head. Right. And she didn't actually see anything and whatever. But the fact that you see the door open like that, it just makes it that much more real. Right. And how creepy is it, too, that it got on all fours to run away? Exactly. It could stand on two legs, but it also could run on all fours as well. Oh, God. That just puts a fucking chill down my spine. Within days, the Dodd family had gotten permission from the local government to relocate, essentially, to a diff- to different council housing. Mm-hmm. They got the heck out of there immediately. Kind of strange that while the Robsons found the heads and did obviously experience freaky stuff themselves, the Dodds kind of got, in my opinion, the scarier experience. Absolutely. The Robsons decided that it was best to just get rid of these heads and gave them to Hexham Abbey Church. And from there, they were donated to the Newcastle Museum of Antiquities at the University of Newcastle. And by all accounts, the Robsons were no longer bothered once they got rid of the heads. Mm, mm-hmm. At the university, the heads were, you know, could finally be examined by professionals in the proper fields, uh, especially there was two in particular, uh, archaeologists and curators, Roger Maquette and David Smith. Whatever supernatural activity that the Robsons and, and the Dodds experienced didn't really manifest there while it was in the custody of the university. Hmm, okay. They had a hunch that these stone heads were perhaps ancient Celtic relics. Apparently, in Celtic culture, it was believed that the soul lived in the head. So heads were very commonly depicted, whether it was in paintings or sculpted. You know, the university reached out to a Dr. Anne Ross, who is an archaeologist and well-known Celtic scholar. She'd authored many books, two of which include The Pagan Celts and Pagan Celtic Britain. She happened to be coming to the university at Newcastle there to give a lecture, and they invited her to study these stone heads. She was quite taken with them. 
and the university even let Dr. Anne Ross take these heads home with her back in the south of England, down in Southampton, uh, where she usually was working at Southampton University. She, little did she know she was bringing something home with her she couldn't even fathom. Just like when the Robson boys found the stone heads, almost immediately after bringing the heads home, Dr. Ross and her family began to experience strange things around their house as well. It started simply and mundane enough. A shadow would move in the corner of their eye, and yet when they would look, of course, nothing would be there. Unexpected cold spots would move throughout the house, things that are weird but could also be explainable. And then, of course, doors began to open and slam by themselves. Or the family would hear a crashing sound like something glass or something fell over somewhere in the house, and when they got to wherever the sound was coming from, nothing would be out of place. But it got to the point where it could no longer really be dismissed when Dr. Ross had an experience in her study. She was deep in her work when all of a sudden the door to her study burst open as if someone had kicked it in. Hmm only for no one to be standing there on the other end of the door. But literally, like, someone just huh. heaved hoed and kicked it in. So that's a ton of energy right there. Right, like, boom! And she sat there for a moment, stunned, obviously. And as she did, she began to feel a cold sensation, as if something she couldn't see had just entered the room. And this happened, actually, to their front door a few times, too. The family would be going about their day, whatever, and boom, the front door would burst open like someone had just kicked it in. And of course, there would be no one there. So pretty freaky stuff. Really freaky, really weird. I mean, when you we hear about things moving or doors opening, things like that, it's usually pretty subtle or, right. or slow. And so the fact that there was enough energy to like throw open these doors is a lot. Absolutely. This must be something powerful, whatever is going on. Right. Now, keep in mind, this is only within a few days of her bringing the heads home that all of this is happening. But it all escalated to another level when one night at around two in the morning. Keep in mind, that's another reoccurring thing. A lot of these more severe things would happen between two, three a.m. in the morning, which a common trope. The witching hour. So it's about two a.m. and Dr. Ross suddenly awakens in her bed with a start, like sitting up straight. And the room was freezing, and and she had this feeling of dread in her, yet she had no idea why she would feel so afraid. She sat there in the dark next to her sleeping husband, wondering why she was feeling so afraid with no apparent reason. And that's when she saw it. Standing in the bedroom doorway, she saw a figure standing in the dark. Just like the creature the Dodds had seen, the figure stood about six feet tall with legs that appeared somewhat human, but with the torso and head of an animal, like a wolf or a goat. Just after spotting it, before she could even react, the creature turned and dashed down the dark hallway. And here's where it gets even more fascinating. As terrified as Dr. Ross was, she had this irresistible urge to chase after it. Mm. In a flash, she got out of her bed ran out the bedroom door, down the hall, into the staircase. She caught a glimpse of the creature reaching the bottom of the stairs and turning and running towards the back of the house. Dr. Ross gets down the stairs and turns to follow it to the back of the house, but stops dead in her tracks. Whatever had been compelling her to make chase had suddenly stopped, and she was flooded by the fear you would expect one to have if you were to see this sort of creature. She said she stood there and she she couldn't see it. It was all dark and she couldn't tell. She had this feeling that something was waiting for her in the dark. Like it wanted her to run in there after. Oh, yeah. Huh. And so she kind of came to her senses and she ran as fast as she could back upstairs and and to the bedroom where her husband's now sitting up wondering what the heck's going on. She tried to explain to him the best she could about what she had seen, and the two of them cautiously ventured back downstairs together and searched the home, but found nothing. Nothing except the back door standing wide open. Mm. Of course, once again, the door just staying open. Here's a quote from Dr. Ann Ross describing that experience. We always keep the hall light on and the doors open because our small son is a bit frightened of the dark, so there is always a certain amount of lighting coming into our room. And I woke up and I felt extremely frightened. In fact, panic-stricken and terribly, terribly cold. 
There was a sort of dreadful atmosphere of icy coldness all around me, and something made me look towards the door. And as I looked, I saw this thing going out of it. It was about six feet high, slightly stooped, and it was black against the white door. And it was half animal, half man. The upper part, I would have said, was a wolf, and the lower part was human. And I would have again said that it was covered with a kind of black, very dark fur. It went out, and I just saw it, clearly. And then it disappeared. And something made me run after it. A thing I wouldn't normally have done, but I felt compelled to run after it. I got out of bed, and I ran, and I could hear it going down the stairs, and then it disappeared towards the back of the house. When I got to the bottom of the stairs, I was terrified. So interesting that, despite their fear, they want to chase it. Yeah, huh. Well, I mean, we've kind of seen this before, right? In different cases. Right. This feeling that these entities or things or ghosts or whatever can give you. Right. That you can either to feel scared or to not feel scared when you should be scared. Right. Kind of in both directions that we've heard about this time and time again. Right. You hear about that with cryptids and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And aliens. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, despite that insane experience, Dr. Ann Ross wasn't even herself yet ready to accept it. She had been working long, rigorous hours and tried to convince herself that she had just had a a very vivid nightmare mixed with a bit of sleepwalking. And it also should be noted that her husband was apparently not too pleased with her for bringing these stones to their home. But later, the family would be forced to realize that whatever was going on, it certainly wasn't just a simple case of sleepwalking. A few days later, Dr. Ross and her husband had to travel to London for work and wouldn't be back until later that evening. And this wasn't unusual, and the family kept a key hidden out in front of the house under a flower pot that the kids could use to get in and out of the house. So Bernice, their 15-year-old daughter, she gets home from school about 4 p.m. She knows her family's not going to be home for a while, so she grabs the key and makes her way inside. Now, her family, uh, they have a cat, and usually the cat would be there to happily greet them at the door, but... Today, that didn't happen. Bernice thought that was weird, but she put her stuff away and called out to her cat. She walked around a bit, not finding her, until finally she heard a faint meow coming from the living room. Bernice goes to the living room, and sitting there on the other side of the room is her cat. Bernice thought it was strange that the cat was acting this way, and she approached it and reached out to pick it up, but shockingly, it hissed at her Mm. and backed away. And Bernice is confused. This cat was a very loving cat. Very, You know, was not uh, in her mm. personality to be like that. Right. Or he, I don't know if it was a boy or girl cat, but you know what I mean. It wasn't right. like this cat to act that way. But that's when she heard a strange thud upstairs. A thud that sounded like a heavy footstep. This put Bernice on alert because as far as she knew, she was supposed to be the only one home at the time. So she called out, Mom, Dad, is that you? Thud. Another heavy footstep. Oh, f***. By now, the cat has backed all the way into the corner of the room, its fur standing on end. Slowly, Bernice walks out of the living room into the entrance hall, where the stairs lead up to the second floor. And, of course, all the lights were out because everyone was gone. Mm -hmm. So she just sees the staircase sort of ascending up into darkness because all the lights were on. She calls out again. Hello? Thud. Another heavy footstep. Bernice is now frozen in place. Thud. 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 The heavy footsteps sound like they're walking across the floor upstairs, approaching the top of the staircase. Thud. Thud. Terrified, Bernice looks up the staircase into the darkness as the thudding approached. Thud. Thud. And then, thud. Bernice watched in horror as a foot came down out of the darkness, stepping onto the stair. Mm. A moment later, thud, the other one came down. And these feet were certainly not human. The feet and legs seemed to be covered in a coarse, dark fur with claws extending out from them. Thud, thud, thud. The figure emerged as it descended out of the darkness down the stairs until it came into full view. And standing there on the stairs was this monstrous part man, part wolf goat entity. Bernice and the creature 
make eye contact for a brief moment, and Bernice lets out an uncontrollable scream. And the beast, startled by her scream, it quickly leaps over the railing, boom, landing on its feet on the first floor and running into the back of the house, Mm. vanishing at the end of the hall into another room that I guess was their music room. Cut to later that night, when Dr. Ross and her husband come home. They come home to find that Bernice had barricaded herself in the living room, clutching her cat, too afraid to come out of the living room. Even once her parents had come home, wow. she didn't want to come out of the living room. I mean, can you blame her? I know, right? Over the next two days, the other children, uh, Ross children, would see this beast as well. But the final straw came when Bernice was bringing up a tray of food to her father. I guess he was in bed feeling unwell. Bernice climbed up the stairs, turned the corner on the second floor landing towards her parents' bedroom, and there standing in the hallway was the beast. Of course, Bernice screams, and once again, the scream is as freaky as this fucking creature is. Every time someone sees it and screams, it seems to startle it. Right, right. And it once again leaps over the banister, landing on the stairs, and takes off running and, of course, is gone. It's funny, uh, Bernice commented that the sound of its feet hitting the wood stairs when it jumped over the banister sounded padded, almost like an animal's feet. Mm. And once again, as terrified as Bernice felt, she had this odd compulsion to chase after it. But as soon as it vanished into the dark, that feeling dissipated. Well, enough was enough, and Dr. Ross's husband said she needed to either get rid of these stone heads or he'd be taking the family with him and getting out of there. Well, she did just that and not only donated the two Hexam heads, but all of her other Celtic artifacts she had in her house. Uh, She donated them there to the university. So this sort of, from what I can tell, and I'll circle back because this timeline gets kind of choppy, but as far as I can tell, this kind of ends her direct contact with the stones. Interesting stuff so far. Yeah. Some things to circle back and note. By the time the stones had come to Dr. Ann Ross... By the time the Robsons had given them over to the Abbey, who then gave them to the university, uh, they had kind of become a a bit of a media sensation. In fact, many of my sources say that there had not been an archaeological discovery that captivated the UK public like this since the discovery of King Tut's tomb in the 20s. Oh. And how strange that these heads seem to carry along with them a curse of some kind, just like Tut did. Yeah. Shout out to our King Tut episode. Yes, a lot of fun. Well, as these things do, it brings folks out of the woodwork, many uh, who may or may not be telling the truth or the whole truth. One such person was a man named Des Craigie. Craigie lived at Three Reed Avenue, the house where the Robsons lived back in the 1950s. Uh, he worked as a lorry driver, and but at the time, uh, in the 50s, he was working for a company that worked with cast stone. And he claimed that once his daughter asked him what he did for a living, so to show her, he at work uh, had these made these little heads using a combination of mortar, stone, and water, essentially cement, and showed them to his daughter. And apparently she wasn't impressed because she buried them in the backyard. Here's a quote from an interview he did with the Evening Chronicle. I made them about 16 years ago. I made the heads from bits of stone and mortar simply to amuse my daughter when she was a little girl. I actually made three, but one appears to have gone lost. They were out in the garden for years. I definitely made them. I've been laughing my head off about these heads, and I cannot understand why all this attention is being paid to them. So interesting. We have someone who's saying, hey, these things aren't ancient. I made these just a couple decades ago. Right. Doesn't take away, hey, maybe there's still creepy shit happening, but it does call into question the their age. But also anyone could just say that. A- absolutely. Dr. Ann Ross was obviously not about to take this line down and asked that Craigie prove it, you know, put his money where his mouth is. So he produced a couple of stone heads, but the quality was very poor, clearly not made of the same materials that the Hexam heads mm-hmm. were made of. The heads were also examined by two leading professionals in their respective fields while at uh, Southampton University. One was Professor Hodson at Southampton University and the other Dr. Douglas Robson of Newcastle University, not related to the Robson family, I assume, the ones that found it. It was a different Robson, the person who worked at the university there. Well, Professor Hodson claimed that the stone heads were made of sandstone and quartz, which is very common in the area where they were found, indicating that these were perhaps indeed ancient relics. But Dr. Robson 
said he was able to detect an artificial cement-like material that would indicate that they were made in modern times. Keep in mind, both of these men were very well respected in their fields and had no stake in whether these things were authentic or not. So Yo, weird that they didn't get the same result. It's wildly different results. And like I said, neither one had like a stake in it. They right, didn't, right. If it ended up being not real, it doesn't matter to them. Well, the Stones would exchange hands a few more times. In 1977, they came into the care of a chemist named Don Robbins, whose work was, I guess, rather controversial. He was an associate of Dr. Ann Ross and had worked with her on books in the past. Uh, He's most known for his book, The Secret Language of Stone, in which he theorizes that stones can actually essentially record and hold energy and trauma from past events. Really? Very interesting stuff. Wow. That's, oh. He also noted some strange things happening while the stones were in his keeping. The day he got the stones from Southampton University, he had them in like in a container of some kind. He walks them to his car, and the moment he gets in his car with the stones, all of the electronics in the car die. Also, when he had them at home, he also felt like the heads would watch him. But all that said, he said there was nothing, though, as drastic as what Dr. Ann Rod. He didn't see any beasts or mm-hmm. no real poltergeist activity other than the feeling of being watched and maybe the heads moving a bit. And he said he couldn't even tell if any of this weirdness was associated with the stones themselves. Mm, okay. But yeah, so definitely weird things, but nothing to the level that the previous folks had experienced. And in fact, in early 1978, one of his dogs apparently chewed on one of the heads. Oh. Well, there you go. I don't know what that means. But uh, in February of 1978, the stones would change hands for the last time, as far as we know, when they were given to a man named Frank Hyde. Hyde was an astronomer and electrical engineer, but was also apparently a prolific dowser. Dowsing, I'm sure many of our listeners know, is a very, very old method of divination to yeah. allegedly locate things, you know, whether it's water, specific minerals, treasure, even bodies. Both Hyde and Robbins researched the stones together, and they tried various divination experiments with them. Hyde apparently had a homemade Faraday cage, which is a sort of enclosure meant for the purpose of blocking off electromagnetic fields. They also used the dowsing method on the heads as well, though I'm not really sure what that experiment would consist of. But here's what's interesting. When the rods, when the dowsing rods were near the boy stone, they didn't really react at all, but would twitch around the female stone head. Mm. And this led Hyde to speculate that perhaps the strange supernatural activity was emanating from the female stone alone and not the both of them. Oh. And people have even gone on to further speculate, what if the boy stone is sort of like an object of good energy and its purpose is to sort of counterbalance the energy of the right. you know, the female headstone, but that's obviously, who knows? That's all just speculation. But here's what's weird. When Robbins dropped the stones off with Hyde, that would be the last time he'd ever see or speak to him. By all accounts, it seems that Frank Hyde simply vanished off the face of the earth. Robbins tried calling him, but couldn't get a hold of him. He'd later hear rumors that Frank was involved in a bad car crash. Not a fatal one, but just a bad one. But that's all he could find out. Now, this is where one of my sources comes in, the Hexam Heads blog. An incredible, incredible source. Whoever's behind it, they've done incredible work. They were able to do some very impressive sleuthing and were able to find out that Frank Hyde apparently died in 1984 while living in the Camden area of London. Strangely enough, decades later, a family called the Newtons moved into Three Reed Avenue, and apparently in 2008, they had a priest come to perform an exorcism at the home. Who knows if it's related to what was going on with the Hexham Heads, but interesting. But while we may possibly know where Frank Hyde was at the end of his life, what is unknown is where the stones are today. Oh, really? No one knows where they are. Oh, where could they be? That's so crazy. That's going to drive me crazy. Absolutely wild. Because I want to know if there's anything else that has happened since then. Now, I want to round this all out by once again recommending the source in particular, which is the Hexam Heads blog. I, like I said, I'm not really sure who is in charge of it, but literally everything you could want to know, you can find there. Like when the Robsons handed the, over the heads to the uh, the local abbey, the church, he do like the specific names, like uh, the, the woman who worked at the church, who they handed it to, who she handed it to. At the, if you want well, like those specific boom, 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 like crime scene notes, like right. go, it, it's, it's just impressive. Very impressive. They even uploaded a very rare document, a pamphlet. I have no idea how they could even find it. 
and after reading through it, here were some fascinating things that kind of refute certain aspects of the story. For example, we were told how Ellen Dodd, when she first saw the beast, was when she was looking after her daughter Marie, who had the ear infection. Right. Well, in this rare pamphlet on the blog, it contains an interview in which Ellen says on the night she saw the beast, it was her son. Her son had called out to her and he was in tears because he was explaining someone or something was pulling his hair to the point it was like hurt, crying. Oh. And then that's when she saw the beast. Mm. There's also a few fascinating things about Colin Robson that I just wanted to include. Colin was the older brother who found, with his brother Leslie, who found the heads. Now, first, remember I mentioned there was apparently a mysterious flower that grew in the place where the heads were found. Well, the family at that time had a pet budgerigar, or a budgie for short, which is, I guess, a type of parakeet. Oh. I didn't realize it, but after dogs and cats, they're like the third most popular house pet. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, yes, I know what you mean. Well, when their pet bird, Sparky, died, I guess they had buried it out back near where the heads were, and they claimed that a sort of glowing bush grew where it was buried. And the curator of this blog actually was able to locate Colin Robson in 2017, and here's an excerpt from that interview. When you buried the budgie, it was reported that a glowing bush grew in the garden. Do you remember anything else about this, and do you believe it was the heads? Yes, he was buried in the garden, and yes, there was a strange small bush that grew in the corner of our back garden, but the bush grew in the exact place the heads were unearthed. And yes, the bush used to have a strange glow at night, almost as if it were producing its own light. Did the heads feel hot in your hands when you held them? No, the heads felt cold, if anything, but they did make your hands tingle. Have you ever experienced any other paranormal events at any other time in your life? Yes, I've had quite a few instances, and I do seem to have a sense to pick up spirit presence. Mm. So interesting. Interesting to know. I, the Why I, I waited till the end, because I just didn't want to cram when I was trying to tell a linear right, story. I didn't right. want to get it muddled and, and get people confused, so I thought it would be best at the end to sort of circle back and add these elements that may or may not have happened. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. And maybe that's why, like he said, maybe these people were just happened to be more attuned to this type of activity. Right. And that's why all of these people were able to experience something. And maybe that's why we haven't heard anything since then, because whoever has these heads, maybe they just don't have the sensitivity to right. it. I don't know. It's a good question. And also fascinating to note was that sometime before finding the heads, Colin, for a school project, I guess had to make, it was like a school competition, had to make sculptures from clay, and he made heads that looked very similar to the ones he found. Oh, now, weird. These were not the same heads. It's not like he took his the heads he made right. and buried them, because they had those also. But it's just so wild that they kind of, like, the faces kind of resembled. Now, keep in mind, they're very rudimentary, but there was something about them that did resemble the ones Colin had made yeah. for his school project, which makes one wonder, what if this is a weird, roundabout, poltergeist thing? Like, what if Colin manifested these heads? What if all this poltergeist activity, what if it was emanating from him, the beast and everything, the heads, but it was something he, like, manifested? Right. And also, let's consider the look of this beast, okay? You, when you think of something with the head of a goat, the wolf, you know, I, I think from a Judeo-Christian, Abrahamic background, we, we associate that with the devil or, right. just, or just evil. But as we know, in Celtic mythology, there was Cernanus, there was all these, there was goat-like mm -hmm. entities. Like, what if this was a Celtic entity? Not a demonic entity in the Christian sense or the, the Abrahamic sense, but a something older, an old pagan deity attached yes. to these items. I think that's so interesting and really cool to think about because... You're right. We have seen these the similar imagery with other Celtic right. beings. So, and in that these aren't necessarily evil, but we just view them as evil because that's how we associate right. these features right now. I don't know. Absolutely. Well, that's going to wrap us up, folks, for the horror of the Hexum heads. Dylan, thank you so much for doing that research. That was one hell of an episode. Oh, of course. Of, let me tell you, let me list you some beasts I wouldn't mind walking around our house. Oh, yeah, come on. 
Of course, the dream James Watkins, the finished face via Alunkus, the madman Marcus Hall, the vivacious Vicky McHugh, the tenacious Teresa Hackworth, the heartbreak kid Chris Hackworth, the oh-so-suave Sean Richardson, the British bonebreaker Bex Martin, the notorious Nicholas Barker, the terrifying Taylor Lashmet, the Count of Cool Cameron Corliss, the Archduke of Attitude Adam Archer, the sinister Sam Kiker, the nightmare of New Zealand Noeline Favilli, the loathsome Johnny Love, the carnivorous Kevin Bogey, the killer stud Carl Staub, the Firestarter, Heather Carter. The Conqueror, Christopher Damien Damaris. The awfully awesome Annie. The murderous Maggie Leach. The Sir of Sexy, Sam Hackworth. The evil Elizabeth Riley. Lauren Hellfire, Hernandez Lopez. And the maniacal Laura Maynard. Damn, that was hot. Dylan, thank you so much for listing off those righteous, righteous names. Of course, of course. And of course, just like, rate, subscribe, tell your friends, family, loved ones, evangelize the name of Creep Street. Please do. Citizens of the Milky Way, my name is Dylan Hackworth. I'm Maureen Bogey. Good night and goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>